Welcome to Major Exports of Cyrene. Cyrene's main source of economic wealth was in the cultivation and export of poppies and silphium. Though the opium oil from the poppies was also an export, little is known about this crop. Information about the cultivation of silphium, however, is more accessible to us. Silphium, with its yellow flower, was considered a gift from the sun god. Grown solely in this region near the Mediterranean Sea, silphium extract was exported at high prices and was so crucial to the wealth of Cyrenaica that it was depicted on their coins. Silphium's roots produced a resin used by both the Greeks and Romans in medicines intended to cure cough, fever, indigestion, and many other ailments. It was also used as a contraceptive. In a compilation of culinary recipes from the 4th century BCE, the herb is mentioned in various recipes, including a flamingo dish. High demand, overexploitation, and possibly a shift in climate all contributed to the eventual extinction of silphium. The last mention of it dates from the 4th century CE, and to this day, no traces of this plant have been identified.
Welcome to Roman Forts. The size of a Roman military camp, known as a castrum, varied significantly depending on how many soldiers it needed to accommodate. However, they all shared common characteristics in design and construction, such as this fort before you, located in Cape Chersonesos. Rectangular in shape, the forts were heavily fortified by ramparts and a ditch system. The walls were reinforced with parapets, essentially an extension at the roof line which allowed a protective barrier for patrolling soldiers. Depending on the availability of materials, some forts were built with stone, timbers, stacked turf, and particularly in the eastern part of the empire, baked brick. <laughs> Access doors on all four sides were each flanked by guard towers. The commanding officer was positioned in the middle of the camp, giving him a clear view of the troops and the main gate. Along with sleeping barracks for the soldiers, the fort also had a granary that was expected to hold rations for a year or longer. To ensure the health of the soldiers, every camp was equipped with medical staff and a hospital. A clean water supply with conduits for a bathhouse and latrines was included in the construction of every fort.
If you have some time, check out Alexandria. It's one of the greatest cities in antiquity. Welcome to Jean-Francois Champollion. Between the 5th century CE and the Renaissance, knowledge of hieroglyphs was entirely lost. Many enthusiasts tackled the challenge of deciphering the language with little success. Some groundwork was made with various researchers identifying names and some grammatical structure and confirming that cartouches were markers for royal names. They were still missing a critical piece of information that would eventually be revealed thanks to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was found in 1799 by Bouchard, a soldier in Napoleon's army. The stele dates from 196 BCE, written in ancient Egyptian and Greek with three scripts, hieroglyphics, demotic, and Greek alphabet. Following the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1801, the English took possession of the stone. It has been at the British Museum since 1802 and remains the most visited object of the museum to date. The first translation was of the Greek section only, in 1803. It detailed a decree of Pharaoh Ptolemy V, reminding the citizens that their pharaoh had led Egypt to prosperity. It was fully translated 20 years after by Jean-Francois Champollion, who was working with a facsimile. Through his studies of the stone, Champollion was able to make a critical observation that would unlock the whole mystery, that hieroglyphics were not only ideograms, but also phonograms. Hieroglyphs consist of phonetic glyphs, single characters, and logograms. Essentially, they are a combination of phonetics, 
alphabet, and full words, which in total form a language. While studying the stone, Champollion realized that there was a difference in the number of hieroglyphic characters in relation to the number of Greek characters for the same word. This led him to believe that hieroglyphs must have phonetic characteristics. This was the first step to unlocking the Rosetta Stone's secrets. To prove this theory, Champollion began identifying Egyptian rulers' names and then compared their phonetic pronunciation to the Greek version. For example, Cheops had been the Greek name given by ancient chroniclers to the owner of the Great Pyramid, Khufu. The next step for Champollion was to confirm that his approach was verifiable by using the Philae obelisk as an additional reference. Engraved in the obelisk are two inscriptions in Egyptian hieroglyphs and Greek. Once he confirmed the names of Ptolemy and Cleopatra within these texts and confirmed the same phonetic patterns as on the Rosetta Stone, Champollion knew he was on the right track. Champollion had already mastered several ancient languages when he took on deciphering the Rosetta Stone. He used his knowledge of Coptic to identify the solar disk hieroglyph on the obelisk as the phonetic translation of Ra. Further translation only strengthened his conclusion. Egyptian hieroglyphs encompass the alphabet in both phonetics and determinative ways, which means that the symbol represents the word itself.
to Flora of Ancient Egypt. The climate and unique geography of the Nile Delta offered a wide variety of plant species. Many of these plants served as sustenance for ancient Egyptians and as crops for trade. The Nile's consistent seasons allowed Egypt to sustain itself for centuries. Possibly the most useful of the plants was the papyrus. This tall sedge plant grew in abundance along the water's edge of the Nile. Commonly known for its use as paper, the ancient Egyptians found many other functions for it, including rope, sandals, and mats. Papyriform boats made from the plant are seen in paintings and reliefs, and were used in ritualistic ceremonies. There were many types of trees along the River Nile, such as the date palm, carob, and tamarisk. The earliest fruit tree cultivated was the fig tree, followed by apple, pomegranate, and eventually olive trees during the era of the New Kingdom. Mango cultivation was the result of a late import from Asia during the Middle Ages. Some trees were associated with gods, such as the acacia with Horus. The divinities Thoth and Seshat were depicted inscribing the reign of the king into a Persia tree. The sycamore was connected with the goddess Iset, patron of the ritual of life. Take your time. I'll wait. It's not like ancient Egypt is going anywhere.
Welcome to Bringer of Life, the River Nile. The ancient Egyptians called the dark fertile soil of the Nile the Black Lands, and the surrounding desert was referred to as the Red Lands. The dramatic difference of productive land opposed to barren desert had a deep influence on cultural ideology, mythology, and religion. The Nile determined much of Egyptian civilization. For example, the seasonal cycle of the Nile was so consistent that ancient Egyptians created their calendar around it. The flood season, or Akhet, was when the departing floodwaters left arable soil for crops. It was followed by the growing and harvesting seasons, known as Peret and Shemu. These regular seasons, along with abundant wildlife and rich soil, meant that Egypt's denizens were able to nourish themselves and ensure their country's strength in trade. Thank you. 
The River Nile, flowing from the south to the north, neatly traversed through both Upper and Lower Egypt. All of Egypt's major cities were built along this narrow ribbon of life. Protected by mountain ranges and deserts which acted as natural barriers to enemies, and sustained by the Nile's plants and wildlife, Egyptian civilization enjoyed economic and cultural prosperity for over 4,000 years. Both ancient Egyptians and ancient Greeks referred to the Nile as the river in their respective languages. Stretching a distance of over 6,700 kilometers, the Nile is one of the longest rivers in the world. It flows south to north, spanning 11 countries. The River Nile originates in the region of the great sub-equatorial lakes, including one of the largest in the world, Lake Victoria near Tanzania. The river flows through African equatorial forests, swamps, volcanic lands, steppes, and deserts, splitting apart for a while and picking up various sediments from each region and carrying them all the way to Egypt. Its main artery, known as the White Nile, rejoins with the Blue Nile in Khartoum. This is where it weaves through rich deposits of silt and nutrients, carrying them along in its wake. The Nile crosses six cataracts from the south to the north, creating natural obstacles between the various sections of the river. The cataracts are long zones of about 100 kilometers where the bubbling and rapidly swirling waters advance tumultuously amid enormous heaps of rocks and benches of hard stone.
It is after crossing Nubia and the first cataract that the river officially returns to Egypt in Aswan. There are still a thousand kilometers before it reaches Cairo and the Delta, bringing life to those living on its shores before it eventually empties into the Mediterranean Sea. Ancient Egyptian irrigation and water use was centered around the Nile. However, they also had access to streams and rivers, as well as several large lakes. The Delta, situated at the north end of the Nile, also known as Lower Egypt, is a large irrigated area where the river splits into several tributaries. The delta had several major brackish coastal lakes, bodies of water separated from the sea by thin strips of land. A mix of deep to shallow waters, salt swamps and sand plains, these lakes were refuge to a wealth of species, as well as water and land plants. The occasional bandit could also be found sheltering within the denser reeds, waiting for the unwary traveler. 